1923, the good bishop founded a congregation, the Religiosas de la Enseñanza Cristiana, the religious of the Christian teaching or Christian doctrine. He founded this in Bawan, Batangas, because Bishop Persos had for his trust catechism. Because as a priest who comes from a systematic bailiwick, he found that the need of a place in order for them to, to find the real thing, the real doctrine, they need to be indoctrinated. They need to be catechized. That's why out of that interest, Versosa founded this congregation and later on named them Missioneras Catechistas del Sagrado Corazón, Missionary Catechists of the Sacred Heart. Professional Bao in 1947, presided by His Excellency, the Bishop, the co-foundress, Laura Mendoza, Batangueña. He was the first bishop in the Philippines to welcome the Pink Sisters. The Pink Sisters are very influential to us. We, we, we used to go to their monasteries and ask for their prayers. But we should know that the first bishop in the Philippines to get them here is Alfredo de Sosa, your relative, your ancestor. Aside from that, he is also the first bishop in the Philippines to welcome the Pauline Sisters. The publishers of a Catholic literature, the Poland Sisters of Social Communication. And aside from that, he's also the first bishop in the Philippines to welcome the Carmelite Fathers who are now working in Infanta. Uh, the famous Bishop Julio Lavallen, uh, the one who joined the pricing during, uh, I guess, in Oku or the other one. Manila Peninsula, the bishop who was there, Julio Lavallen, belongs to that congregation. We don't know if it's a Gersosa influence, we don't know. But he comes from that congregation. In 1944, he had to ask the Holy See for a helper. And one of his favorite priests, his protege, Alfredo Villar, was named his auxiliary bishop. At present, he's not a candidate to the same thing. This, this, this is the start of the whole thing, of the crisis. After the war, Bersosa invited the Carmelite sisters to open at their house in Lipa. And in an old hallowed ground, which used to be the site of his seminary, which was burned down by the Japanese, in which thousands of defenders were killed, he had to build his monastery there in order for a reparation. Because thousands of defenders were killed, as a reparation, they had to build a monastery. And at this point in time, 1946, some years after, here comes the phenomenon. The famous phenomenon of the rose petals. The Blessed Virgin Mary appeared to a postulant, Carmel, um, Carmelite postulant, Teresin Castillo, declaring herself as the Mediatrix of all grace. Which at that time, a new idea in theology, a new idea in Mariology, because of course, the, 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 the thing that they used to was there is only one mediator to the Father, it's Jesus Christ. Mary cannot be a mediatrix. That's a new idea in theology. That's a new idea in Mariology. And here comes Mary declaring herself the mediatrix of all grace of the Racine Castillo. And as a proof of that veracity, they, of course, they had to report the matter to Bishop of the Art Auxiliary. Bishop, there's a lady appearing to me declaring herself as the mediatrix of all grace. And the word of Obiyar was, tell the lady, if she is true, if it's true that she is Mary, tell her to give us a tangible manifestation. And here comes the phenomenon. The shower of rose petals. Coming from nowhere. And in every, in a petal, you could find a lot of images, the images of saints, the images of Jesus Christ, the images of Mary. Until today, this is um, cannot this cannot be explained by science. Because in 1948, imagine where can you get hundreds and thousands, hundreds uh, thousands of rose petals and drop them over the Carmelite monastery in 1948, just after the war. You could not find any plantation of rose, rose in, roses in the Philippines. And according to experts. 
these petals were petals of roses coming from Russia, not Filipino roses. In a time that you don't expect advanced technology to be doing these things. And the claim was it was done by the sisters uh, using a blower, etc., etc. So the church had to act on this. And here comes the thing. They cannot do anything on the miracle because the bishop of Lipa seems to have approved it. Well, he did not make any, any formal pronouncement, but he believed on it. Remember my story? He had a personal encounter on the petals. Then, the only thing to suppress or the only thing to freeze the issue is remove the bishop from his diocese. So, in 1949, the bishop received a letter from the Holy See declaring the Diocese of Lipa under apostolic administration. So this diocese is now under or directly managed by the Holy See and we are appointing another bishop to govern this in the name of the Holy See. And that bishop is Rufino Santos who was at the time auxiliary bishop of Manila. Not yet, he was not yet a cardinal at that time. He was made uh, as the administrator of the diocese and in canon law, in the old canon law, when the residential bishop, that's Bishop Versosa, is removed from his office, it follows that his auxiliary is also removed. So when Versosa was removing Lipa, it followed that Obiara had to be removed also as auxiliary bishop. So it was Rufino Santos doing all those things, together with the Nuncio Banucci. Then, Versosa went home to Vigan and he suffered a kind of nervous breakdown. Because he could not accept, I mean, as a human person, he had been doing all the good things for the church. He had, he had done all, all of those things. He built churches, he, he initiated programs for the salvation of souls. And yet, he was considered that way. He was made that way. He was brought to that way. And in this case, he suffered a lot, psychological torture. He went home to be done, and he became like that. He died in 1954 under the care of Bishop of Monsignor Gregorio Salvatos, whom I interviewed when I was doing the research. He just died. He just died last year. Monsignor, at the age of 94, Gregorio Salvatos. He was sent by Bishop of Villar as a grateful as a grateful protege of Versosa to take care of the Bishop here in Digan. He was here for two years and he related to me the suffering of Bishop Versosa. So he said he was suffering from a nervous breakdown. And he always asked me, have I done anything wrong? Why are they doing this to me? No matter, let us bow to the will of the church. That line is the summary of his heroism. Why are they doing this to me? No matter, let us bow to the will of the church. We can link two things here. The human in him. Why are they doing this to me? Why are they persecuting me? Why have they led me to suffering? No matter, let us bow to the will of the church. His heroism. Despite of his, that, that the church will increase and he decreased. His martyrdom, his suffering. And he died in 1954. A peaceful death according to Salvatus, a saintly death the death of a just man. And just right after his death, the Bishop of Deacon released a pastoral letter, a circular letter, declaring that Bishop Versosa died with the death of a just man. Very peaceful. And according to our faith, when a person, die, person dies calmly, it's actually a bonus coming from the Lord. Hindi siya yung walang remorse or whatever. He died peacefully. It's a bonus. It's a prize. It's a divine prize. He was buried in the cathedral of Bigan, not in his spiritual bride, Lipa Diocese. He was made titular bishop of Katsa. What is that? Katsa is a reformed diocese somewhere in Africa. Just for him to have a diocese, they named him bishop of the diocese, which in concrete reality does not exist. And that's the end. That's Alfredo Bersosa Obispo, your ancestor, my idol, the intercessor of the Yohannes. Thank you very much. Everybody.